I'm so thankful that uh, standing up here and kind of, you know, there's, there's almost a pressure that comes with doing something like this, but the Word of God takes all the pressure off of me, right? right. Because the Word of God in and of itself has, the in, it's, it has its own inherent power. Right. It's alive, and so it does the work. And so I'm just going to read my Bible today, and that's all I got to do. Amen. It's going to be yes. so It's going to be so good. I'll go ahead and lather you up with another joke, though, just to make sure you're awake. Um, this, one, this first one has to do with my mom, but not my mom. This is just a joke. Say this is a joke. Okay, it's a joke. So um, my mom died when we couldn't remember her blood type. As she died, she was telling us to be positive, but it's really hard without her. Be, be, be positive, blood type. There you go. Yeah, they're still getting it. Okay. Um, earlier, I asked my phone, I asked Siri why I'm still single, and my front camera activated. That's, that's tough. That's tough. Just don't try that. If you're single, don't try it. You don't want to ask Siri. That. Why is it that when you donate a kidney, people love you, but when you donate five kidneys, they call the police on you? Why? What's that about? <laughs> okay. Uh, this one says, I, at a party, a young wife admonished her husband. That's the fourth time you've gone back for ice cream and cake. Doesn't it embarrass you? Why should it? He said, I keep telling them it's for you. <laughs> <laughs> I would not try that, husband, so don't do that. Don't do it. Oh, how many of you were here last week? Show of hands. All right, awesome. So this is going to kind of be a continuance of last week. If not, you can check that out. And uh, even if you weren't, you don't check it out. You're like, I'm not going back to watch that. I believe God's so good, he's still going to get something to you today. It'll be good. But just for a quick review, a few of the things we talked about. We talked about the promises of God last week. Hopefully, uh, your assignment, listen, if we're coming to church and we're just listening and not doing anything with it, is that doing us any good? It's not. So one of the things I left you is write down a promise from God. Write down one promise from God that you're believing him for. That's it, just one. One promise from God that you're believing him for. So hopefully you did that. If not, you can do that today. You could do that during service. It wouldn't hurt my feelings if you're doing it right now. Because we found in 2 Corinthians, it said all of God's promises, what are they? They are yes and amen through Christ. So because of Jesus, all of God's promises that you find right in here, he's saying yes to them. It's not a question of if God will or wants to. He says, yes, I do. And through Christ, you just say amen. amen. In Jesus' name, amen. and they're yours. Yeah. That's it, yeah. right? Um, and we, we found out that the more God's promises are fulfilled in my life, the more of God's promises in my life, the more I take on his divine nature, right? So the more of God's promises that I'm walking in, the more I look like him, yeah. Right? I mean, that makes sense. If God's going to promise us something, it's going to be something from him. It's going to be something good. And so when those things are active in my life, I now look more like him. And guess who that's appealing to? That's appealing to the world. And guess what that does for you too? That blesses you. You want to be walking in God's promises for your life, right? We want to be a walking billboard of God's love and God's goodness to the world. That's what we should be doing, right? So uh, we ended last week's message. Uh, we talked a lot about faith. We're going to talk some more about that today, but also patience. How many of you have heard? It's faith and patience. That's some of your favorite words. I can tell you love that word, patience. Uh, so the title of this morning's message, if you're taking notes, is Wait For It. You ever seen those? You ever watching like on YouTube or one of these platforms and, and the video, it's like these epic fails or something, and it says, wait for it, wait till the end. And they're just trying to get you to watch the rest of the video, Right. And usually the, the end is stupid or it's like pff, the first part was way better, right? Well, this is, this is what the title of today's message is. God's saying, wait for it, but there's a right way to wait for something, right? And the thing with God is that when you wait for it, the end is never disappointing, ever, ever, ever. It's worth the wait. Someone say it's worth the wait. It's worth the wait. Um, so I want to pray for our service. You know, we've got the 4th of July uh, coming up, Independence Day on Tuesday. I want to pray for our nation as well. Uh, and I want to read this in 1 Timothy chapter 2 real quick. You don't have to put that up there, but I just want to read what it says here. Remind us of this before we pray. Paul's talking to Timothy. He says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. 
Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Does that sound good to you? That's the type of life I want to live, a peaceful, quiet life marked by godliness and dignity. Well, it tells us how we can do that. We need to pray for all those who are in authority over us. I've got one amen out of that. This is the Bible. This is the Bible. It says this, this is good and this pleases God. Uh, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man, Christ Jesus. There's one. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. And so as we celebrate freedom, uh, freedom's been ringing at my house all stinking week late into the night. I don't know (laughs) what these people, these people have unlimited money when it comes to fireworks. It is unbelievable. I don't even know who it is. They're down my street, but they've been celebrating freedom all week long. So, good for them. But, but Christ has purchased freedom for everyone. For everyone. And so, he's purchased freedom for everyone, and as we celebrate our freedom this week, uh, we're celebrating our independence uh, from another country, from other countries, but we need to be celebrating our dependence upon God. Our forefathers had it right. Uh, we, we became independent from those who wanted to hold us under their rule, but it was one nation under God, and it's still one nation under God, right? One nation under God. So let's pray. Let's thank the Lord for the freedoms uh, that we get to experience here and that we get to come to church, read his word, and be encouraged in it uh, without any persecution here this morning. It's amazing, isn't it? Father, we just want to say thank you for where you have us. Thank you uh, that you have us here in Alma, Arkansas, the United States of America. Thank you for this country uh, that you founded, Father, to launch your gospel into all the world. And we're just so thankful that we get to be a part of that. Uh, So, Father, use us to see this gospel preached and to reach others with the freedom that Christ gave us as he died for all men. Father, thank you so much. Uh, We do. We pray for our leaders in this country. We thank you that this country is not going to hell in a handbasket. This is still one nation under God. And as the body of Christ, as we submit ourselves to you, thank you that you are moving on our behalf and you are reaching more and more people every day for your kingdom. We thank you for Father, we give you this service. We give you this time. Uh, Holy Spirit, you have your way today. You're the teacher. And so we're expecting to receive something from you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's open up in the main passage we we talked about last week in Hebrews. Somebody go to Hebrews. We're going to go to chapter 6. I don't know why I'm going in here. I'm actually reading out of a different translation. Hebrews 6, 13. I'm going to read this from the Passion Translation. Hebrews 6, 13 uh, through verse 18. It says, Now when God made a promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater than himself, he swore an oath on his own integrity to keep the promise as sure as God exists. So he said, have no doubt, I promise to bless you over and over and give you a son and multiply you without measure. So Abraham waited patiently in faith and succeeded in seeing the promise fulfilled. It's very common for people to swear uh, on oath or an oath by something greater than themselves, for the oath will confirm their statements and end all dispute. So in the same way, God wanted to end all doubt and confirm it even more forcefully to those who would inherit his promises. Say, that's me. That's me. His purpose was unchangeable, so God added his vow to the promise. So it is impossible for God to lie, for we know that his promise and his vow will never change. Will never change. So I want to remind you this morning that God has made promises to you, and these promises are for right now, right now. These promises are for right now, and God has not, he will not, and the best part is he cannot go back on his word. He can't do it. He can't go back on his word. He can't change his mind about what he's promised you. Why? Because we see here in uh, verse 13, he's keeping this promise as sure as he exists. God would have to stop existing for him to break a promise to you. How many of you know that ain't happening? God ain't going to stop existing. So his promise to you is sure. It's sure. I want to read this. And he's talking to Abraham here in Hebrews talking about Abraham in Hebrews 6, but here in Galatians uh, 3, Galatians 3.14 says this, through Christ Jesus, God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham. 
so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. This is the same blessing. We have the same blessing available to us that God promised to Abraham. That's good news. If you don't know about that, go read about the blessing of Abraham. But what, it, what is this blessing? He was talking about, this is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is what, what the, the promise was about when he promised Abraham. Who is this blessing? Who is this promise available to? Believers. Say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. You have to be a believer to receive these promises. And I want to remind you, in verse 15, I'm going to read this again. And if you didn't write it down, I want you to write it down now. It said, Abraham waited patiently in faith and succeeded in seeing this promise fulfilled. I want you to write this down, and I want you to replace, replace Abraham's name with yours. So Landon waited patiently in faith and succeeded in seeing the promise fulfilled. Amen. Wow. It's awfully quiet in this. Oh. God, y'all can't multitask? Come on. You're, all right. I like it. Hey, you're writing it down. Some of you aren't. Y'all are just staring at me. I don't know what you're doing. Listen, take notes. Take notes in church. If you don't take notes, if my wife tells me to go get something to the store and I don't write it down, guess what? I ain't getting it. I'm getting Snickers ice cream bars. I'm getting uh, other ice cream items, and that's probably it. You know, I might remember one thing. Got to write it down. Landed waited patiently in faith, in faith and succeeded in seeing the promise fulfilled. So let's talk a little bit about faith real quick. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11. I'm gonna go through some scriptures today, so y'all better buckle up. Let's buckle up and get ready. Can y'all listen fast? Yes. Hebrews 11, uh, this is one through three. This is also in the Passion Translation. It says, now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. This testimony of faith is what previous generations were commended for. Faith empowers us to see that the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God's words. He spoke and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. So we know from Romans 10, 17, how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God, right? So we could, we could look here in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and I could say, now the word is what brings our hope into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. The word, faith. Because faith can't come except from the word, right? So the word is what gives substance to our hopes. It becomes the foundation required, and it's all the evidence required for proof. You know, any case, any case that's, that's brought against you, you know, we sometimes in church, we talk uh, a lot about courtroom settings, right? We talk about a courtroom setting where God is the judge. And, you, you know, there are cases brought against us all the time. There are accusations brought against you. You might be accusing yourself of something and condemning yourself for something. There are things in your life, like we were talking about after worship, that may not line up with what God's word says, right? How many of you have, are dealing with something like that or have dealt with something like that? For sure, all of us. So when there's something going on in my life that doesn't line up with what God's word says, I know from Hebrews chapter 11, verse one, faith, God's word is the only proof that I need. Right. It's the only, it's all the evidence required for proof, That's right. all the evidence required for proof. Right. But listen, it matters whose courtroom you're sitting in. Okay. This is, this is really important. It matters whose courtroom you're sitting in. Are we sitting in a court where God is the honor? Your honor, the judge, or are we sitting in the court of public opinion where we care more about what people might think of us if we live by faith? Oh, this is super important because, because if, we're, if we're sitting in that courtroom, we're going to get a lot of um, people are going to mock you. They're going to roll their eyes at you, and it's going to want us to press your desire to live by faith because you're looking to what people think about you instead of what God has said. But when I place myself under God and I'm living by faith and I'm in his courtroom, look, his word now becomes the only thing. Look, his word is all the evidence required for proof in his courtroom. The world, the court of public opinion, the world does not care about faith. They think you're crazy if you live by faith because they think you're out of your mind. They do. They do. 
And so we, there, there's like this balance that we have to strike. It's not a balance between, okay, uh, walk in this line. We have to just reconcile the fact that if people want to think I'm crazy because I'm living by faith, that they can think what they want to think, but I'm going to have what God said I can have. Amen. And I'm going to appeal to God who only appeals to his word. So the question is, who do I allow to be judge in my life, God or people? God or people? I, sh- I shouldn't need any more evidence than what God's word provides me. If I'm seeing something in my life that I know that God didn't promise me, I shouldn't be looking to that. All I need is the evidence of what God's word says. It's all the evidence required for proof. Let's skip down to um, verse 8 here in chapter 11. We'll read verse 8 and 9. It says, It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner uh, living in tents, and so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. So, Even when he reached the land that God promised, the Bible says that he lived there by faith. So he walked into the promise. He walked into what God had promised him, and somehow that wasn't the end. The Bible says that he lived there by faith. So many times we get a taste of God's promise in our lives, and then we think that's it, and we grow grow complacent. We do. We grow complacent uh, with where we're at, and complacency is an enemy to God's promise in, in your life. It is, it, I, guys, I've experienced this before. I've received many of God's promises in my life. And once I did, I grew complacent with where I was at then. And I just left it there. And guess what? I, 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 I stopped living by faith just like I was before. And I stopped seeing the same victories that I saw before. It's not a coincidence. So once we receive a promise from God, we're to, by faith, we're to continue living by faith there. Continue. In Proverbs chapter 1, 32, uh, it says, For simpletons turn away from me to death. Fools are destroyed by their own complacency. But all who listen to me will live in peace, untroubled by fear of harm. So what's the antidote to complacency then? Listening to everything that God says. This scripture tells us right here. All who listen to me, it says, but. There's a nice conjunction there. But. Someone say, but. So you're a fool for, it says those, uh, you're a fool, fools are destroyed by their own complacency, but all who listen to me, all who live by faith will live in peace, untroubled, untroubled by fear or harm. Amen. Listen, we said this last week, if living by faith was easy, everyone would be doing it. Everyone would be doing it. And this is a thing in the body of Christ that you don't even see that often. If living by faith were easy, all of us in here would be doing it, and we would just be, I mean, faith-filled people living by it every day, seeing God's promises right and left, and people flocking in droves because they want what we have. That's true. Look, that's the goal. That's what we're going to have here. We're to be a people of faith living this way. Living this way. But it's not easy. That's why everyone's not doing it. We have to, we have to be willing, like Abraham, to call those things that are not as though they already were. And this is what the world thinks is crazy. What are you doing? This is the reality. This is what you're facing. Listen, faith isn't something that, that denies a fact in your life. This, we, we've got, as Christians, we've got to get past this. Faith is not denying facts. That's not what faith is. It's appealing to a superior reality. Okay? And as a Christian, as a believer, you, you must understand that this world and everything that we see right here was created, we read this in Hebrews chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 3, by the Word of God. Everything we see was created by God's Word. Well, what, what was there before God's Word? God's Word, God's words created everything. Everything. They created everything. And that's all we need. We have God's Word still. We have God. So if I see something that doesn't line up with God's words, am I going to am I going to give more weight to that or to what God said? This is this is where we decide. Am I living by faith or am I living by what I see? Right. Um, First Timothy, chapter six, verse 12. 
Paul told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. How many of you have heard this before? Fight the good fight of faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. So this is the fight of faith, holding tightly. Holding tightly to the eternal life that God has called you. This is the fight of faith, holding tightly. I want to go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Hebrews 10, 23 is a similar scripture. And it says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Amen. This is good news. You. you need to hold tightly, hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. God can be trusted to keep his promise. He can be. Yes. He can be trusted. All right. Uh, in Hebrews 10, we're going to skip down to verse 35. We're already in Hebrews 10. Skip down to verse 35, and we'll read verse 36. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. Patient endurance. Look at your neighbor say, you need some patience. Look at your other neighbor and say, why does he keep making us do this? Because we need to talk back in church. We need to activate our faith in church. We've got to talk to each other. Yeah. We need, you need patience. Yes. How many of you can say, don't, y'all looked at your spouse. I know you did. If your spouse in here said, you need patience. You need patience. We all could use some patience. Yeah. Uh, and I want to read a little bit about like, what patience truly is and what Bible patience is and what it means here. Um, in fact, in, when it's talking about patient endurance here, the best uh, Greek word or there's a Greek word that best describes this, and what it means is perseverance. Perseverance. And here's the definition of perseverance. Persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. Persistence in doing something. Despite difficulty, despite difficulty, it's persistence. It's endurance. It's staying the same. You know, this can also be defined as the ability to wait the correct way. Waiting, all these words uh, sometimes have this, uh, have this um, I don't know, like they're a passive, like they're passive words. Waiting, patience, um, endurance, like I'm, we're just kind of waiting around and it's a passive thing. And that's not what we're talking about here. That is not what Bible patience truly is. Um, I want to look at Genesis 8.22 real quick. Genesis 8.22 says, while the earth remains... Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not see. So, summer's here to stay, guys. It's here to stay. Listen, I'm just reading the Bible. I hate to tell you. Uh, guess what, though? Cold. Uh, the cold's here to stay. Winter. Listen, uh, global warming does not trump what the Bible says. The Bible says, as the earth remains, as long as it remains... There will be winter and summer, and there will be cold and heat. The Bible said it. I mean, I mean, seriously, some of these things that are talked about, uh, th there is like no consultation to this at all. And I'm like, how much more does this need to prove for people to look at it and say, you know what? Um, and you know what this Bible also talks about? Global warming is going to happen at some point, and this whole ball is going to be set on fire, Right? It'll happen at that point, so maybe they'll be proved right then. But as long as the earth remains in this state right here, we're going to have cold and heat. We're going to have winter and summer. Hey, we're going to have fall and spring. Woo! Praise the Lord. We need more fall and spring. Thank you, Jesus. Um, seriously, like, I don't mind the summer, but what, God, on your green earth should we do in this heat? Seriously. <laughs> Like, I, I legit was very thankful, wasn't I? I was so thankful this week. I thank God, like, I was being genuine. Like, God, thank you that we have a house that's air, with air conditioner. Yeah. Can you imagine not having air conditioner? I mean, you've probably had, not had air conditioner at certain times in your life. I mean, sweet Jesus, what would we do, right? I was not, I was not built to be, a, to be a pioneer, to be a pilgrim or whatever. Whoever lived back before 1990, like, it wasn't me. I wasn't meant for that time. <laughs> I was meant for, say, I'm meant for this time. This is my time. God knew. God knew. He said, I gotta, that dude's got to be born in the 80s or 90s because, yeah. 
I needed him to stay alive for a while. Okay. <laughs> so we're talking about, uh, there's this funny word that we don't like to talk about a lot in this scripture. It's kind of hidden in that word seed time. It's called time. Seed, time, and then harvest. You know that when you plant a seed for something, there's, a, there's typically a period of time before you reap the harvest on that thing, yeah. right? So this is a spiritual law. This is a natural law. Seed, time, and harvest. And we don't, we like, we like, we really don't like the seed part. We really just like the harvest part. But you need to understand that you, you shouldn't have any expectation to reap a harvest from a seed that you never sowed. I mean, that's deception at its finest right there to think that I can reap a harvest from a seed that I never sowed to begin with. And the, the, the way that we sow seed spiritually is by speaking. My speaking, my saying is sowing. Saying is sowing, right? And so I can be sowing negative things. I could be talking about how bad things are, or I could be talking about God's word. But whatever I'm saying, there's going to be a time period that happens, and then harvest is coming. Harvest is coming. And so there, there is a time period here between seed and between harvest. And so it, it would be good to know how to pass this time correctly. So Because if we do that, if we do that, you know, there are things that you can do after you've planted a seed that can help the, the uh, speed in which your harvest comes about and the quality of harvest that you have, right? By watering it, by giving it sun, if it, if it requires it. There are things, there, are, there is a way to wait correctly, to patiently endure from the time I plant a seed until the time I'm ready to harvest, right? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, let's go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Listen, if y'all are good listeners, I'm going to get y'all out of here for lunch. Okay. You don't want lunch. I got it. Listen, let's just see how quick you listen. But if not, y'all aren't, y'all just don't care about lunch that much. And I respect that. We got God's word. We got God's word to chew on. James 1 chapter 2, uh, 2 through 8. And I know this is some of our uh, favorite passages of scripture. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. You know, I always thought this was a stupid verse. <laughs> if I could call any verse stupid, I'd be like, I, I don't like that verse, right? There's a reason it's in here, though. Uh, why would, when troubles come my way, why should I consider that great joy? And it goes on to tell us, but we don't like reading the other verses either, so we kind of just stop and move on to something a little more that we like. Listen. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Verse 4, so let it grow. Let it grow. Let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Oh, man, this is, this is good news. Listen, when your, faith in te- when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. All right, let it grow so you you will be perfect and complete. That word perfect means mature. You will be mature. Mature people, mature people are patient people. Mature people know how to endure, endure. If you need wisdom, verse five, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Aren't you thankful for that? If you need wisdom in any situation, the Bible says clearly, if you need wisdom, ask God. He's not going to rebuke you for asking. Okay? And it says, he'll give it to you. He'll give you wisdom if you ask him for it. It's just that, that plain and simple in verse 5 right there. But when you ask him, listen, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Don't try, don't ask God for wisdom, but at the same time, be conjuring up. I've done this so many times, how I'm going to make something happen. God, I'm asking you for wisdom, and I think it's going to happen this way. <laughs> or this way, maybe. Ask him for wisdom and wait for him to tell you what his wisdom is. My guess is that he's going to point you to his word some way. Um, He'll not rebuke you, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Don't waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. So we're talking about divided loyalty. Loyalty. This is what we were talking about earlier. It's really whose courtroom am I showing up to? 
Whose word am I siding with? Am I siding with the court of public opinion where this is kind of the mainstream status quo, this is, this is what's going on, so this is the direction that I'm going? Or am, I, or am I showing up to God's courtroom where I'm appealing to him based on his word? Right? So this is, this is what divided, whose word am I siding with? And listen, if I'm, a lot of us, like, you know, we'll come to church and for the rest of the day, day, we might be siding with God's word, but when we see something contrary the next day, we're, we're off of that and we're just siding with whatever the world says. Yeah. This happens a lot. Guess what this is called? This is undiv- or divided loyalty. James says that this is an unstable person. And when we're doing that, when we're just going back and forth and we're not living by faith, living by faith means that you're staying there. You're living there. You're not just switching every time you feel like, I mean, if we're doing things based on how we feel, that's not living by faith anyway. I've got to settle what I'm going to live by. And if this is going to be the final authority in my life, then I'm going to have to set my emotions and what I feel aside and appeal to God's word when I'm going through something. Right? Right? This is living by faith. Because if I don't, the, I'm, the Bible tells me that I'm unstable in all my ways, and I shouldn't expect to receive anything from God that way. If I'm unstable and I'm siding with other words and coming under different words, I can't expect to receive anything from God that way. There's just not any way. Um, I want to read verse 4 again. Uh, verse 3 and 4. For you know that when your faith is tested... Your endurance has a chance to grow. It has a chance to grow. Okay? So you're telling me there's a chance. It's got a chance. But you've got to take that chance and do something with it. There's two different ways that can go. It has a chance to grow. So let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And so I want to look at, for the rest of our time here, I want to look at the story of Joseph. Uh, this is probably my favorite story in the Bible. Uh, I've gone over it a lot of different times. And when you're talking about somebody who was given a promise from God and did basically what we're talking about right here, this is a great example for us to look at to see what it should look like. What does a life of faith look like? So let's start here in Genesis chapter 37. And we'll uh, read about Joseph for a little bit. Genesis 37 verses 2 and 3. Are y'all with me? All right. Genesis 37, 2 and 3. says, This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. Another great reason we were born in the 1900s, folks. (laughs) Or would be a bunch of Bilhahs and Zilpahs. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things his brothers were doing. Joseph was tattling on his brothers. And the Bible says in verse 3 that Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. So, man, this is kind of harsh when you, when you think about it. Man, Jacob loved Joseph more than his other children. But what does it say is because Joseph was born to him in his old age, and I want to look at why Jacob felt this way about Joseph. Uh, and if you know the backstory at all, um, I believe there was even a few messages ago where, where a pastor was talking about um, Jacob and Esau, right? And if you know the story at all, you got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? So we're reading about Jacob right now. Abraham and Joseph. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph was Jacob's 11th son, 11 sons. Uh, He ended up having 12, but he was his 11th one. So if you know the story about Jacob and Esau, Jacob stole Esau's blessing, got his birthright, stole the blessing. Esau found out about it, wanted to kill him. Uh, His mom found out about it and said, Esau wants to kill you, so I want you to go over to my relative, to my brother Laban, uh, until your brother can, can calm down. So uh, Jacob finds out that, that he's going, and um, Rebecca, Isaac's wife, makes something up about, I'm tired of all these women around here, these godless women who are here for our boys. And Jacob's like, okay, your mom doesn't like these women. Go over to, to her family. And, you know, back then they, they married in their families. 
It's weird, it's gross, it happened, but listen, that's how, that's how things were then. So he went, to, he went to Laban, which was his uncle. And uh, Laban had a couple of daughters. Do you know what their names were? Leah and Rachel. And he, he, when he got there, he saw Rachel, and he was like, uh, okay, I know that you're my cousin, but she had a sparkle in her eye, right? <laughs> her eyes sparkled. That's what, that's what it, the Bible says. But Leah had dull eyes, you know? I mean, that's, that's a tough break, dull eyes. That was Leah, Leah asked Siri why she was single, and it opened up the front part of her camera, you know? <laughs> but Rachel's eyes sparkled, it said, and she had, the Bible even says she had a nice figure and a lovely face. So, like, Rachel's hot, okay? He liked he sees Rachel, and um, so he, he gets to, to his uncle's house, and he ends up working for him, and he says, hey, listen, I know we're relatives, but it's not right for you to just work for me for free. You know, what do you want your wages to be? He said, listen, I'll work for you, and he said, he's been there just a short time anyway, and things have been going really well for Laban. So Laban's probably like, dude, whatever you want, just say it, and I'll give it to you. And Jacob set these terms up where he said, all right. I'll work for you for seven years if you'll give me Rachel as my wife. And Laban was like, um, done deal, sold. I think Jacob could have, could have got off with like six months or something. Like, dude, just went way too long on these terms right here. He needs a, a course in negotiating. But seven years. And so seven years goes by. And the Bible says that during those seven years, they felt just like a few moments for Jacob because of his love for Rachel. Like, think about it. Man, seven years just felt like a few moments because of his love for Rachel. So the seven years come up. He has increased Laban so much with, with all the work that he's doing. And Laban pulls a fast one on him and gives him Leah on this wedding night. And apparently, uh, Jacob doesn't even find out that it's Leah until the morning. I don't know what they did at these parties during the weddings, but that's tough when you don't even know that was the girl you were supposed to be marrying, right? So just a lot of weird things happening. Um, back then, Jacob wakes up the next morning and he's not too happy with, with what's going on now. He said, you promised me Rachel. And he said, listen, it's not, we don't marry off the second daughter here first. It's, it's custom to marry off the first daughter. He said, well, I agreed to marry Rachel. And he said, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll give you Rachel as your wife also. So now the dude's got two wives. He actually has three because he got Leah's handmaiden with Leah. And, and now Rachel, he said, okay, I'll give you Rachel if you promise to work for me for another seven years. And Jacob must have loved this girl because he's like, all right, I'll do it. And he did it, and so he gets Rachel too and, uh, and her handmaiden. So Jacob somehow, like this is where this whole sister wives crap started, I'm assuming. <laughs> it, it just seems like a terrible deal if you ask me. Um, but... So he, he got Rachel, the one, the one that he loved. Well, Rachel struggled having, having children, and Leah was just popping them out left and right. And she had like five or six before Rachel had any. In fact, Rachel was like, I can't stand this. I'm giving you my handmaiden as your wife um, but because I'll just have a child through her. I mean, this, isn't this interesting that this also happened with Abraham and Sarah? If you remember, Isaac and Rebekah struggled to conceive too. And now Jacob and the woman that he loved. And we know God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I want to get into this just a little more in a minute. I'll probably get, probably get ahead of myself. But so here we are. Um, I was just giving you a little backstory there. He had to wait a little longer. So Rachel finally ends up having her first child with Jacob, and it was Joseph. So this kind of gives you a little insight as to why Jacob uh, saw Joseph a little different. This was his first son with the woman that he intended to marry all along, right? His first one with her. So uh, I want you to remember this. Write this down. People tend to treasure the things they wait for. People tend to treasure the things they wait for. You know, waiting builds anticipation. How many of you are like this when it comes to maybe a vacation that you're taking or something that you're really looking forward to? The anticipation itself is almost just as good as the actual thing, right? If you like Christmas or a certain holiday, the, the buildup, the season of waiting till that time, I mean, is it just me or does anyone else feel that same way too? I mean, because what you can do is the anticipation, you can build it up in your head of how great it's gonna be. And sometimes you do that so much that your vacation or whatever it is that you're anticipating isn't even as great as what you built it up to be because of your anticipation being so great, right? 
And that's what waiting does, though. It builds anticipation. I want to read a cool passage here uh, from Romans 8, 18 through 24. I'm going to read it from the Passion and then uh, a few um, scriptures or a few verses from the message. It says, I'm convinced that any suffering we endure, Romans 8, 18, is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. The entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. Guys, think about that. That's amazing. Like the universe, not just our little planets here and this solar system, not just this earth, but the universe is standing on tiptoe, waiting, waiting to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. That's you and me. For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. But now, with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. To this day, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation as if it were in the contractions of labor for childbirth. And it's not just creation. We who have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit also inwardly groan as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies being transformed, for this is the hope of our salvation. So what we're talking about here is creation and God's people in this period of waiting until the fulfillment of what God's doing at the end of this age. Like, there is anticipation building even now for what is going to happen at the end of this dispensation. And all of creation, that means the trees, the rocks, the waters, the the stars, all of it is waiting for this same thing, and so are we, coming to this fulfillment. I want to read verses just 23 and 24 in the message. I don't know if, if that's up there, but here's what it says. That is why waiting does not diminish us any more than waiting diminishes a pregnant mother. Does waiting diminish a pregnant mother? Or make her larger. It's okay to say it. It's all right to say it right here. Don't look around. Just look at me. But, but pregnancy, you get larger before delivery, right? right. Waiting doesn't diminish a pregnant mother, That's right? right? Um, all right. We are enlarged in the waiting. We, of course, don't see what is enlarging us. But the longer we wait, the larger we become and the more joyful our expectancy this is, this is a really good parallel to what we're talking about today. So we need, to, we need to equate waiting. When I'm waiting on God's promises to be fulfilled in my life, if I'm not equating that to really what's happening is God's promises are gaining interest in my life right now. When I, when I invest something, I expect to be gaining interest on my investment, right? And there's going to be a waiting period until that thing is fulfilled, and I should have been gaining interest the whole time on that. It'll be bigger, better, and more than we could have ever imagined. Yes. Bigger and better. And there's, you know, I, I experienced this in my life. Um, you know, many of you may know this, some of you may not, but my wife and I adopted both of our daughters. So we adopted Lainey and Hartley. And the story of about how that came about was really, I mean, a lot of this, a lot of what I'm talking about, man, we had to learn kind of as we went that we, we weren't waiting the right way or doing things the right way at all. Uh, but God, but God, right? So we were married as you, if you were here last week, we celebrated our 19th anniversary that I talked about, but we got married when we were 19. So we were 19, we were working full time. We were going to school. We thought, you know what? This is a great time to start a family. <laughs> Teenagers, you know, just, just married, got, you know, all this stuff. So that's what we set out to do. And, um, you know, years go by. You know, you have questions. You know, you have some answers, frustrations, ups and downs, and all these things. It's this roller coaster. But the word is what kept us, and the word is what sustained us. Man, I, I, want, to t- I want you to hear this again. When you're going through something, and it was years, the word is the only thing that can keep you and sustain you during that time. If you don't have the foundation of the word then there's a lot of crap and stuff under a foundation that you can find yourself sinking into. But when you have the foundation of the word, you can't get any lower than that right there. You have the word. The word is supposed to be our foundation, right? And so I became familiar uh, with, you know, when we were dealing with infertility and things like that, I became familiar with every story of infertility in this book. 
And so the ones we just talked about, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Hannah, all these stories. And I did find it interesting that the, the patriarchs, as we call them, all dealt with this. And it encouraged me because I'm like, man, there, uh, the enemy was trying to stop something happening. And so uh, I, I can have the same victory that they had. The same exact victory, and you can too. The same exact victory that they had. So I was familiar with all these stories. Um, but at that time, adoption wasn't an option for me. That, that was off the table for me because I was in faith, right? I was in faith. And um, it was supposed to end just like it did on all these stories right here. That's how, I, that's how I saw it. All these stories of precedence is how I expected things to happen for me as well. And listen, honestly, that's what we should do. That, that should be when we have precedent in God's word, God, God is not a respecter of persons. If he did it for them, he will do it for you. He will. He will. And, so, and that's where I was at. But for me, I was thinking that adoption was a cop-out. It was second rate. And uh, one day, God got a hold of me and said very clearly, he said, uh, do you think my adoption of you was second rate and second best? And so that's when things change for me. You know, you hear, <laughs> you hear something like that and you're like, okay, all right. Got it. Uh, because no, I didn't think that at all. And so he began to change my heart and, uh, and, and I started to see things as he saw them. And, uh, you know, God brought about his promise for us when our faith was in him and we allowed our expectation to grow in time instead of diminish. Our expectation grew instead of diminished. And, and that's the thing, you know, I, I still believe that. I believe that there's precedence in God's word that if you're dealing with infertility, if you've ever dealt with that or struggled with that, um, there's precedence in here. If God did it for them, he would do it for you. And I still believe that right now. If we wanted to have children of our own, I, be, I believe it, but I don't. I don't. I don't. But actually, I don't. I don't want it. <laughs> we joke about this all the time. Like, it would be very funny if God thought that was funny, but I don't think it's funny. <laughs> I don't think it's funny. God changed my heart, and my heart still changed, so he doesn't need to be funny anymore, okay? But I do believe, I do believe, if that was a desire of our heart, there's precedence in here, and if God did it for them, he would do it for me. But he changed my heart on, see, I put God in a, my little box of how I expected him to fulfill a promise in my life. And when we do that, we limit ourselves, and I limited myself for years, for years, because of me putting God in a box. So don't put God in a box. You believe God and you have faith in God for what he said, and he'll do it how he wants to do it, how he wants to do it. Amen? I'll say this again. People tend to treasure the things that they wait for. I tell myself this often with my kids. I treasure you. I treasure you. Everyone's like that. You love your kids, you treasure them, but that's how you got to talk to them sometimes. So, uh, okay, so back to Joseph in Genesis 37, back to this story. So at the first of this, we see that when, when Jacob was saying this about Joseph, when he gave him this robe, Joseph was 17 years old. So Joseph had this dream, had this promise from God. And if you remember what the dream was, uh, it was about uh, essentially his brothers and his mother and father bowing down to him, Right? And, and then he, he just spouted off to his brothers, like, hey, check this out. Here's what's going to happen. They didn't like that much. They were going to kill him. And, man, families were odd back then. Like, I, man, just a bunch of, I don't like what you said. I'm going to kill you, you know? Let's not be like that, okay, with our families. Um, but they decided some, someone was level-headed enough to, hey, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in a pit. So they threw him in a pit and said, hey, pfft. Let's not leave him in a pit. Let's get something for him. Here comes some slave traders. So they sold him into slavery. Um, and then he ends up, and I want to pick up here in verse 32, verse 39, chapter 39. There it is. Chapter 39, verse 1 through 9. It says, When Joseph was taken to Egypt to the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. 
Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord, the Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did. Oh, that would be good for you to write down. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did. Uh, as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. Now, that's good to notice, too. His master, his employer noticed that the Lord was with him and that Joseph succeeded in everything he did. Um, this pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. Let me ask you, is God blessing your employer for your sake? Amen. Man, that's, that's something that we should ask ourselves. Am I here just for a paycheck and what you can do for me? Or is the Lord blessing you because of me? That's, that should be my mindset as I go to my job. All his household affairs ran smoothly and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. <laughs> Relatable. And Potiphar's <laughs> wife... Hey, come on now. I was a little too laughy there. Joseph, Joseph was a uh, handsome and well-built young man. And Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in this entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. Man, this is integrity and character right here. Character and integrity. And I want you to notice from what we, what we just read here in this passage, how Joseph was faithful with another man's while he was still waiting on what God had promised him. I mean, this dude, this dude had, had been through it already. He was just 17 when all of this started happening, right? But he was still faithful with another man's when God promised him something far greater. In order to stay in faith, I must be faithful. If I'm going to live by faith, I must be a faithful person. Faithful. All right, uh, skip down to verses, verse 19 through 23. So if you know the story, Potiphar's wife kept on and kept on, and Joseph kept saying no, and, and the story goes, uh, she yelled rape, he ran out, he got told on, he got lied on. Potiphar, in verse 19, was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. It seems the Lord is with Joseph. Everywhere he goes. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that had happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused, him, uh, caused everything he did to succeed. Man, even when things got worse for Joseph, um, and it seemed, it's amazing, because God gave him this promise. And Joseph, here's, here's a dream. Here's something I'm giving you. Here, here's what you can look forward to right here. From that time, you know, typically when you're given a promise from someone and they say, here's what I'm going to give you. Here's what I promise you. You typically go from here gradually to there. Seed, time, harvest, right? For Joseph somehow, he ended up going this way. You know what I'm saying? He kept getting further away from what God promised him somehow. But he remained faithful, right? He remained faithful everywhere that he went. He, he got his brother sold him out, tried to kill him, sell him out. Man, take a step back this way. He got sold into slavery. He was a slave for a while, kept going back this way. Got lied on, got thrown into prison for a couple years. Kept going this way. But listen, listen. Was Joseph getting farther away from what God promised him? Now, if you know the story, uh, let's hear, let's, let's get back to this. Um, you don't have to turn here. But in chapter 40, in chapter 40, verse 1, it says, sometime later. So he's in prison. He's in prison. And it says, sometime later. This is when the cupbearer and the chef were sent down to prison for a time, right? 
And then they, Joseph told them these dreams, blah, blah, blah. He said, remember me? They didn't remember him. And then two years later, so we're talking about a couple more years in prison here. Two years later, they remembered and Pharaoh had him come up out of prison. And in chapter 41, 46, it says he was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. So what God promised him there, he went from here all the way back to here. But he wasn't getting further away from the promise because in a moment, in one moment, God fulfilled this promise right here when it seemed like he got farther and farther away. Why? Because he was a faithful man. And he, and he, did, he did unto uh, who he was serving as he would do to the Lord. He was a faithful man. If it looks like you're so much further away from what God's promised you, you're not. Because in a moment, God can, God can bring that promise about in your life. This is why we don't look with our natural eyes to what we see, to what's going on in our lives. We always go back to what did God say. If God said that, that's what I'm going to have even though it looks like I'm going the other way. That's what I'm going to have. My current circumstance does not determine my outcome. It does not. God's promises to me, they don't expire. The longer it takes, the better it'll be. How sweet was it that Joseph got all the way down to being a prisoner and he was placed second in command in all of Egypt? How sweet was that? I want to go to verse four, or chapter 41, verse 51 and 52. It says, Joseph named, this is Joseph got married, had kids. Said Joseph named his older son Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. Joseph named his second son Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in this land of my grief. So he named his first two, first two children, causing to forget and fruitful. Causing to forget and fruitful. Let's stand as we close this morning. Listen, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something this morning. Wherever you're at, wherever you're at on this journey right here, I want to tell you something. It's worth the wait. What, here's what I know about God. God is good. God is so, so good. He can take what you've been waiting. This, I, want, I want to read this as I wrote it down. He can take what you've been waiting on for so long and make it seem like you didn't have to wait at all. It will be so good that any amount of waiting can only be described as it was so worth it. This is what you need to believe about God. God, I'm waiting for your promise to come to pass in my life. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. You said this, God. You said this is where I would be. You said I could have this. You said I could go here. You said this. But listen, does it matter how we wait? Guys, it matters. It matters how we wait. But God can take you from there to there in an instant. In an instant. And all you'll be able to say, it was so worth it. Don't hate the wait. Your patience, your faith will end where your patience ends. Don't hate that. Take God's word. Hang on tight to it. No matter what. What is, what is living by faith? What is patiently enduring? It's holding tight. The fight of faith is holding tight to what God said. Don't let go of it. Don't quit on it. We had the saying we said a long time in this church before. If you don't quit, you will win. Quitting is the only thing that takes you out of the race. If you take yourself out, you cannot win. Don't quit. I need you to expect God. Expect him. Expect him to do what he said he would do. This was something that was actually um, said to us when during our time when we were when we were wanting to have children. And uh, it was Aaron. Aaron Huckey said it to us. She's my cousin. I don't know if she, is she's here somewhere. She's in children's. Um, she actually said it to us. She said the Lord told just wanted wanted to tell us this that, you know, this is gonna happen for you and when it does, it'll be so good. Basically what it, what we just read right here, it'll be so good that you won't even remember the struggle that it seemed like you went through to get to this point. It'll be that good. And, that, and that's true. And that's true. I've had kids for 10 to 12 years now, and there's been a lot of stuff happening. I don't even remember that time at all. Sometimes I'd like, God, you could have waited a little longer. It would have been good, you know? It's been that, no, seriously, it's been that good. God's that good. 
So don't despise, if you're in a period of waiting, don't despise that time. You need to, you need to act like it was talking about in Romans. You need to act like you, you, you're giving birth to God's promise in your life and waiting doesn't diminish you. You're just getting bigger with it. And the longer you wait, the bigger it's getting. The bigger it's getting and the better it's gonna be when you receive what God promised you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your promises to us. I thank you that your promises to us are yes and amen in Jesus. Father, for for everyone in here, any promise that you've given them specifically from your word, whatever, whatever they're standing on, Father, I put myself in agreement with them according to your word that it will come to pass in their life because you're not a man that you should lie. If you said it, you'll do it. So I thank you that you're true to your word. So Father, I ask that by the help of your Holy Spirit, just like with Joseph, you would cause us to succeed because you're with us in everything that we do. And we purpose, Father, to be faithful, to be faithful right where we're at and to set our expectation on you and you alone and to live our life like this promise is already fulfilled because that's what faith looks like. We are going to call those things that be not as though they already were, and that's how we live. We will stand in your courtroom, we will appeal to you, and we will live by faith. So I thank you, Father, for strength, for grace, available to every person in here to do that. Father, we love you, we expect you. Our expectation is on you and you alone. We expect you to do what you said you would do, and we know that we'll see it. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We love you guys. I hope you all have a great week. Um, If you're shooting fireworks, be safe. Listen, if you go buy fireworks, you know, remember you're buying the right ones when the person gives you a high four after after they sell them to you, right? So only get those types of fireworks. Be safe. Have fun. Enjoy your family.